हेलो स्टूडेंट्स वेलकम यू ऑल माई सेल्फ प्रोफेसर अमित मिश्रा ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ जेके शाह क्लासेस एंड टूडे आई एम हियर विथ यू टू डिस्कस आर टी पी फॉर नवंबर टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी टू अटेम्प्ट सी ए इंटर लॉ पेपर नाउ सिंस वेरी फ्यू डेज आर लेफ्ट फॉर योर एग्जामिनेशन आई वोट कंज्यूम योर मच टाइम एंड डिरेक्टली आई विल स्टार्ट विथ योर आर टी पी नाउ कमिंग टू योर आर टी पी what your institute that is the icai does is they issue rtp for every attempt that is revision test paper in which in first few pages they will provide us the amendment that is applicable for your particular amendment and apart from that they give us some questions to solve which is descriptive as well as mcq so now first we will have a look at the amendment which institute has proposed for your particular attempt and after that we can move on to questions correct now see you guys are very lucky and it is a good news it is a very good news that for your attempt that is for november 2022 attempt there is no material amendment as such which is going to affect your answers in examination trust me there are hardly any amendment there are more clarifications than amendment okay so now the first amendment that you that you are going to face is from chapter number 2 from chapter number 2 that is incorporation of companies and matters incidental that the amendment is in section number 60 the amendment is in section number 60 now as you guys are well aware section number 16 talks about rectification of name i repeat guys section 16 talks about what rectification of name now if you have revised you would know if you have revised you would know that sometimes a company has been registered or incorporated with a name which is identical to or resembles with the name of the existing company if you remember or sometimes the name of the company is similar to the trademark of the name of an existing company a yes or no so in that particular case what used to happen is central government used to give directions to us to change the name to change the name now if you can see central government gives direction to the company sumoto sumoto means on its own to rectify its name if in its opinion the name registered is identical with or to nearly resembles by the name of an existing company so in that case central government will give us order and we'll have to change the name within how many months 3 months by passing which resolution ordinary resolution very simple so the name of my company is similar to the name of an existing company so central government will themselves give us order to change the name and they will give us a time frame of 3 months within which we should change them by passing which resolution ordinary resolution okay so there is no amendment in this side of section number 16 there is no amendment in this it is same as before now if i talk about right hand side the registered proprietor of trademark that is in this situation the name of my company is similar to the trademark of an existing company of an existing company correct eh? now in this case the registered proprietor of trademark will make an application that name is identical with or to nearly resemble to an existing trademark and will make an application to central government say for example i am registered my company is registered my company is registered by the name called as xyz for example now this name is similar to a trademark of an existing company so the owner of that particular trademark will make an application to central government that please direct this company to change their name because it is similar to our trademark then again central government will give us order to change the name now before amendment whenever central government used to give us order to change our name because it is similar to any trademark they used to give us 6 months to change our name they used to give us 6 months to change our name but now that 6 months have been amended to 3 months so earlier before amendment you used to get 6 months to change your name if your name is similar to an existing trademark now it has been curtailed to 3 months correct now apart from that earlier if you do not change your name on the direction of central government say central government has given you some directions 
and you are not complying with those directions. You are not following the directions of central government. So, in that situation, what used to happen is central government, no? central government used to impose fine, fine. On company, it used to be 1000 rupees for every day and for every officer in default, it used to be fine ranging between 5000 to 1 lakh rupees. 5000 to 1 lakh. This was old law. Old law before amendment. Before amendment. Correct? Which means, if a company is not following directions of central government, where central government has directed them to change their name because it resembles to an existing company or it is similar to any trademark. So, not following those orders. So, what central government used to do? They used to levy penalty or fine on you. On company, it was 1000 per day and for officer, it was something between 5000 to 1 lakh. But now, they have changed their approach. They have changed their approach. Now, what they do? If company is not following or not complying with the order of central government for changing its name, then central government will themselves allot new name. That means, central government came to you. They politely requested that you guys have three months to change your name by passing ordinary resolution. Now, you guys are not listening to the central government. So, what central government will do after those three months? Central government will themselves allot new name to you. Da, take this new name and go. Now, we will do your namkaran. And now, you will use that new name in every documents. You will be known by that new name. However, if central government has given you that name and that particular name you are not liking or you don't want that particular name which central government has allotted to you, then in that case, company may change their name themselves. So, if you do not follow directions of central government, central government will themselves give you name new name. However, if you want, you can change the name given by central government. So, it is very simple logic. If ultimately, you have to change your name because you are not liking the name given by central government, why not to change the name when central government gave you directions? A yes or no? So, now in this situation, this penalty has been eliminated. It has been removed. There is no penalty, no fine now. Not on company, not on officer. Now, central government has came up with a new approach that they are saying, we will ourselves allot a new name to you. However, if you do not like, you can subsequently change the name of the company as per section 13, which talks about alteration of MOA. Which talks about alteration of MOA, whereby you can change your name by passing special resolution and MOA will be altered. Simple, easy. So, amendment was very brief, very, very brief. Earlier, you used to get 6 months over here, but now it is 3 months. Now it is 3 months. Achha. Earlier, it was penalty for not listening to central government. But now, what they do? They will allot a new name to the company. They will allot a new name to the company and will issue a fresh certificate of incorporation. However, if you want, you can subsequently change the name given by central government. Very simple, easy, done. This was the first amendment and the only amendment in chapter number 2. In chapter number 1, you do not have any kind of amendment. Now, there is buzz going around that, sir, the limit of small company has been revised. We have limit for paid up share capital which is 2 crore and for turnover which is 20 crore. But now it has been revised to maximum 4 crore and turnover is 40 crores. So, that 4 crore and 40 crore is not for November 2022. It will be applicable from May 23 onwards. Please do not create chaos. Please do not spread rumors. 4 crore and 40 crore is from May 23 onwards. For November 22, it is 2 crore and 20 crores only. That's it. Okay. So, now in unit 1, there is no amendment. Unit 2, that was the only amendment which we discussed now. Achha. In unit 6, now, there is no amendment in unit 3, prospectus and allotment of securities, unit 4, share capital and debentures, unit 5, acceptance of deposits. No amendment at all. Directly, we have amendment in chapter 6, that is unit 6, registration of charges. Now, amendment is very immaterial. It is not going to affect your answer in any way. But the amendment was brought to you by Companies Registration of Charge Amendment Rules 2022. You don't need to remember this company's registration of charges amendment rules 2022. 
you just have to keep this one thing in mind that whenever company creates charge i repeat whenever company creates charge then it files application for registration of charge in form number cag1 or cag9 yes in form number cag1 and cag9 now cag1 is for normal situation normal situation is normal loan and cag9 is for debentures cag9 is for debentures correct whenever company is making application for registration of charge so if it is a normal bank loan or a normal loan then we file application in form number cag1 but what if it is debenture if it is debenture then we we'll file application in form number cag9 correct so now this requirement of filing cag1 cag9 or any requirement of section 77 which talks about registration of charge will not apply to banking company will not apply to banking company which are fulfilling certain condition see it is given over here that this rule shall apply to nothing contained in this rule nothing contained in this rule now which rule they are talking about they are talking about rule of registration of charges rule relating to registration of charges which talks about that we have to file form number cag1 or cag9 for registration of charges correct so now whatever is written in rule that is filing of cag1 or cag9 within 30 days of creation of charge is not applicable to any charge created or modified by a banking company under section 77 in favor of reserve bank of india when any loan or advance has been made to it under sub clause d of clause 4 of section 17 i write it like this of the rbi act 1934 now now please don't be scared this is nothing this is nothing trust me it is not going to affect your answer and there are 60 70 80 percent chance that they are not going to ask you in this examination see sometime what happens you know banking company needs loan so they approach to rbi and rbi gives them loan on some security so if a banking company is creating security in favor of rbi i repeat once again if a banking company is creating security in favor of rbi then banking company is not required to file cag1 or cag9 with roc am i clear i repeat sometime banking company obtain loan from whom rbi by keeping something as security so in that case if a security is created in favor of rbi then we do not require to file cag1 or cag9 and this is only applicable for banking company and this is a new provision it was not there before theek okay? hai so i repeat if banking company creates security in favor of rbi for obtaining loan short term loan na for obtaining loan then requirement of section 77 and rule 3 which talks about registration of charges is not applicable is not applicable as simple as that is not applicable am i clear am i clear so sir what is section 17 subsection 4 clause d of rbi act 1934 nothing da nothing section 17 says that what business a banking company can do what business a banking company can do theek hai so you don't need to remember this thing just remember one thing if charges created in favor of rbi by a banking company there is no requirement of cag1 or cag9 easy simple acha now bus that was the only amendment in registration of charges so two chapters two amendment unit 2 unit 6 now we'll come to unit number 7 again a very small amendment unit 7 that is chapter 7 talks about management and administration i repeat bachcha it talks about management and administration now you guys are aware there is a section called as section number 94 there is a section called as section number 94 which talks about maintenance of registers and records maintenance of register and records and inspection of register and records now you guys are already aware that every company should prepare register of members i repeat every company should prepare register of members yes or no and 
I don't know if you are aware or not. Those register of members, as well as other documents, say for example, books of accounts, financial statements, not books of account because books of account is not open for inspection to members or outsiders. Books of account is only open for inspection to board of directors. But apart from books of account, say register of members, or financial statements, or any other statutory documents. So, if any person wants to inspect those documents, especially focusing on register of members, if any person or if any member of the company wants to inspect register of members, they can do so. They can do so. Say, for example, I am a member. I am a member of ITC Limited. I am a member of ITC Limited. Now, I want to inspect. I want to inspect. Register of members. Register of members of ITC Limited. Now, sir, why you want to inspect register of members of ITC Limited? So, there may be some personal reason for me. I want to know who all are the members of ITC Limited or how many members are there. Or there can be any agenda behind that. Hana? Given the situation, I want to inspect register of members of whom? ITC Limited. And I am a member of a company. I am already a shareholder in ITC. So, I will make an application to ITC and ITC will show me register of members free of cost. Free of cost. They will allow me to inspect register of members free of cost. Now, say for example, there is a person called as Chinmay. Now, Chinmay is not a shareholder of ITC. However, if Chinmay want to inspect register of members of ITC limited, then he can also inspect by payment of fees. By paying fees, by paying fees, and that fees is very nominal. Huh? It is not one lakh, two lakh. It is a hundred, fifty, like that. Okay. So now, if a member wants to inspect register of members of a company, he can do so free of cost. There can be member or debenture holders or creditors. They can do free of cost. But if any outsider, any other person wants to inspect register of members of a company, then he can do so by paying certain fees. Huh? By paying certain fees. Am I clear? Now, the amendment over here is amendment over here is that if any person is going to inspect register or index or returns, then he will not get he will not get to inspect or he will not get the details which is address or register address. That is, if I want to inspect register of members, then I won't get address. I won't get address of other members and registered address if the member is body corporate. I won't get their email ID also. I won't get their email ID also for inspection. I won't get their unique identification number or I won't get their PAN number. So earlier what used to happen you know, I am an outsider or I am any other member of the company. I am making application to company for inspecting register of members and company used to give me entire details about the register of members where I used to have the access to confidential information such as address, registered address in case of company, email ID, their PAN number, their UIN, unique identification number. So, in order to maintain the confidentiality of the members with respect to their personal details, Bacha party, this is personal details of a member, no? Email ID, their address. And now, what if I look out for all the members and now I am going to some place where I am harassing I am sending unnecessary spam emails to any of other member. For fun, I don't have any interest or any concern with that particular person. But I am sending spam emails. I am sending any parcels to their registered address. So basically what they have done, they have restricted the information which will be available for inspection. And the information that they have restricted are personal information of a particular member. Easy. So, this was the only amendment in chapter number 7 where they are saying that certain personal information will not be available for inspection under section 94. Easy. So, in examination, they may ask you that a member wants to inspect or any other person wants to inspect register of members of the company and he also wants address of other members or registered address if it is company or he wants email ID or PAN number etc. So, this personal information will not be available. Correct? Now, next is amendment in chapter number 8. It was there in May 22 RTP as well. Okay? There is amendment in chapter 2. 
chapter 6 chapter 7 and now chapter 8 now as you guys are aware there is a section called as section number 90 which talks about significant beneficial owner remember hai na section number 90 talks about significant beneficial owner now you, you have also heard about investor education and protection fund iepf iepf section number 125 now ipf is a fund ipf is a fund where certain amounts are credited and certain amounts are debited correct and this fund is used for protecting and promoting the interest of investors correct easy easy now the amendment over here is see if there is a significant beneficial owner and restrictions are imposed on the shares of significant beneficial owner. I repeat, if there is any significant beneficial owner in the company and restrictions have been imposed, restrictions have been imposed on the shares of that particular significant beneficial owner, then those shares are also transferred to IPF after a certain period. After a certain period, that is to say, to be more precise, one year. One year, if you read section number 90, there is entire procedure given over there. There is entire procedure given over there. If you will see over there, it is specifically written that if restriction is imposed, I repeat the language over there is that if restrictions are imposed on the shares of significant beneficial owner, and no appeal, no appeal has been made within one year to remove those restrictions, remove those restrictions, then such shares such shares will be transferred will be transferred to IPF shall be transferred to IPF not only shares but other benefits also not only shares but other benefits also for example if there is dividend on those shares or bonus shares or right shares then all those things will also be transferred to IPF easy simple so this is the only amendment see it is written over here that all the shares held by authority in accordance with provision of subsection 9 of section 90 of the act and all resulted benefits arising out of such shares without any restrictions simple so if a person is significant beneficial owner and restrictions have been imposed on that particular share and if he is not making appeal or any other anyone any person whatsoever who is concerned in the matter is not making appeal to remove those restrictions as a significant beneficial owner to remove those restrictions on the shares of significant beneficial owner within one year then after one year shares will be transferred to IPF it is already there in your textbook JKSC students it is already there in your textbook if you are a non JKSC students don't worry you can make these changes in your respective notes which are using or which you are referring simple done now see we have covered amendment of chapter number 2 chapter number 6 7 8 now in chapter number 9 accounts of company I won't say this is amendment, rather I will use the word clarification. I will use the word clarification. Now, central government is clarifying with respect to CSREs. They, they have issued notification on 5th May 2021, whereby they have said that if CSR funds for COVID-19, then it is an eligible CSR activity. It is an eligible CSR activity. Apart from that, if you are creating health infrastructure for covid care you are establishing oxygen generation and storage plant manufacturing and supply of oxygen concentrators beta this notification is dated 5th may 2021 at that point of time second wave was peak in india whereby we were facing shortage of oxygen if you remember yes so they are highlighting those points as well ventilators cylinders and other medical equipment for counterfeiting covid 19 counterfeiting means fighting with covid 19 
सो इफ यू आर स्पेंडिंग एनी फंड फॉर कोविड नाइनटीन और एनी फंड फॉर डेवलपिंग फैसिलिटीज फॉर फाइटिंग कोविड नाइनटीन देन इट इज कंसिडर्ड एज एलिजिबल सी एस आर एक्टिविटी से फॉर एग्जाम्पल माई कंपनी इज स्पेंडिंग से फाइव हंड्रेड करोर्स माई कंपनी रिलायंस इंडस्ट्री लिमिटेड विच डू चैरिटी ऑन लार्ज स्केल सो माई कंपनी स्पेंडिंग फाइव हंड्रेड करोर ऑन वेंटिलेटर्स सो इज दिस एलिजिबल सी एस आर एक्टिविटी येस एम आई क्लियर सो इट इज अ क्लैरिफिकेशन इट इज नॉट गोइंग टू अफेक्ट योर आंसर इन एग्जामिनेशन अपार्ट फ्रॉम दैट अपार्ट फ्रॉम दैट If contribution is made to research and development projects, as well as contribution to public funded universities and certain organizations engaged in conducting research in science, technology, engineering, and medicine, is an eligible CSR activity. Is an eligible CSR activity. Say, for example, my company gives donation, or my company gives money to IIT Bombay, IIT say Delhi, IIT Roorkee, IIT Kharagpur, IIT Kanpur. and after giving donations those organizations are using that money those organizations are using that money for conducting research in science technology or engineering or any other field so it is also an eligible csr activity correct again clarification the third clarification is company can collaborate with other company for doing csr activity hai na see a company can do csr on its own Apart from that, a company may collaborate with other company also for doing CSR activity. Yes, see, the companies, including government companies, may undertake the activities or projects or program using CSR funds directly by themselves. That is, company may do CSR by themselves or in collaboration as shared responsibility with other companies. So, for example, if ITC wants to do CSR, they can collaborate with Reliance. They can collaborate with any other company, which is also obliged to do CSR activity. Correct? Simple, done, easy. Now, apart from that, there is one more clarification that if a company, if a company is giving COVID vaccine, COVID nineteen vaccination for persons other than employees and their families. See, I repeat. If company is spending money for vaccination, for vaccination of person who are not their employees and families of employees, that means for outsiders, then that is also an eligible CSR activity. It is also an eligible CSR activity. Again, a clarification, not going to affect your answer materially. Correct. Now, this amendment is there, which may be asked you in examination in the form of MCQ. or maybe sometimes in descriptive also now sir what is this amendment now one new amendment has been inserted whereby they are saying every company covered under the provision of subsection 1 to section 135 which means every company which is covered under csr every company which is covered under csr will now have to furnish a report on csr in form csr 2 so they have introduced so they have introduced a new form the name of the form is form csr2 and this form is you uh, this form will be used by the company to report on csr activity to report on csr activity correct now sir 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 we understood sir that now onwards what companies will do company will prepare an annual report on csr activity in form number csr2 but sir we also understand that this requirement was not there earlier yes this requirement was not there earlier they have introduced this new amendment so from when it is applicable for which year we have to prepare report sir so very simple see what they are saying that every company covered under 135 shall furnish a csr report in form number csr2 to the registrar for the preceding financial year and what will be preceding financial year 2020-21 because the amendment is dated 11th february 2022 see date of amendment is date of amendment is equal to 
लेवेंथ फेब्रवरी टू करेक्ट नाउ इन ऑन लेवेंथ फेब्रवरी टू दे इशूड सर्कुलर एंड दे आर सेंग दैट एवरी कंपनी इज नाउ रिक्वायर्ड टू प्रिपेयर सी एस आर रिपोर्ट इन फॉर्म सी एस आर टू फॉर प्रिसीडिंग फाइनेंशियल फॉर प्रिसीडिंग फाइनेंशियल ईयर नाउ इलेवेंथ फेब टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी टू कम्स इन फाइनेंशियल ईयर टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी वन ट्वेंटी टू करेक्ट सो अमेंडमेंट केम इन दर टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी वन एंड ट्वेंटी टू इजी पी जी नाउ इन टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी वन ट्वेंटी टू डेट इलेवेंथ फेब टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी टू they are specifying that company will prepare csr report for previous financial year now previous financial year will be 2020 and 21 correct so now 2020 and 21 is the first year for which csr report will be prepared and it will be filed as an addendum addendum means addition to form aoc4 or aoc4 xbrl or aoc4 nbfc indias as the case may be now sir what is aoc4 so you know every company needs to file financial statement with roc so whenever a financial statement is filed with roc it is filed in form aoc4 for listed companies and big companies it is aoc4 xbrl that is extensible business reporting language and for nbfc it is aoc4 nbfc easy peasy simple done now so what companies will do after 2021 is they will file financial statements and in addition to that one report will be attached in form csr 2 and that report will specifically cover the aspects of csr only correct now but the problem is the problem is we all know that financial statements should be filed for every year now if i talk about 2020 21 the year will start from 1st april 2020 and it will end on 31st march 2000 21 correct now as you guys are well aware that a company should hold its agm within 6 months so man lo let us assume that date of agm is equal to 30th september 2021 so company conducted agm on 30th september 2021 and let me inform you that every company should file its financial statement within 60 days of agm within 60 days of agm so let us say company has filed its financial statement with roc by november say 30th november 2021 so i am explaining you the timeline basically my financial year is starting from 1st april 2020 it will end on 31st march 2021 now within 6 months i should conduct my agm so i've conducted my agm on 30th september 2021 apart from that after agm is conducted and financial statement is approved i will have to file financial statement within 30 days i'm so sorry by mistakely i uttered the number 60 days but it is not 60 days it is 30 days correct so say for example 30th october 2021 i filed my financial statement with roc that means i have filed my aoc4 or aoc4 xbrl or aoc4 nbfc indias as the case may be i filed with roc now what they are saying is see amendment is Amendment is dated 11th Feb 2022. Now 11 amendment came on 11th February 2022. Correct. Now on 11th February 2022, they are saying that you will prepare report for 2021 onwards. 2021 onwards. That is for financial year 2020 and 21 report will be prepared, and then it will continue. Say 21, 22, 22, 23, 23, 24, so on. Now for 2021, they are saying you should prepare form CSR two, and you should file it with AOC four or AOC four XBRL or AOC four NBFC Indias. But the problem over here is that amendment is dated 11th Feb 2022, and if I follow the maximum timeline which I have, I have already filed my AOC four XBRL on 30th October 2021 itself. I have already filed it on or before 30th October 2021. 
and they have uh, came up with an amendment on 11th Feb 2022. So can I say for the first year it is not possible to attach CSR 2 to financial statements? A yes or no? A yes or no? Hey na? So in this in this case, what will happen? You know, they have given a clarification that provided that for the preceding financial year, that is for 2021, CSR 2 shall be filed separately on or before 31st March 2022 after filing form AOC 4 or AOC 4 XBRL or AOC 4 NBFC. That is for first year. That is for first year. That is 2021. You don't have to attach it to AOC for X barrel because there might be case you have already filed AOC for. So in that case, we have given you time till 31st March 2022. You file your CSR2 separately and do not attach in AOC for X barrel or AOC for whichever is applicable. Correct? But this is only for 2020-21. Now, what about 21-22? In case of 21-22, we'll have to file CSR 2 along with AOC 4 or AOC for X barrel or AOC for NBFC. Easy? Done? So, this was the amendment. This was the amendment that you had in your law. Frankly speaking, the amendment from chapter number 2 and the amendment from chapter number 9 which talks about form CSR 2 are the only material amendment which we are going to face and I think they will ask questions from that. Otherwise, the other amendments are not much of an amendment. They are just clarifications. Correct? Easy? So, this was the only amendment that you were supposed to learn and now we will start with the questions. Okay? Now, here are our questions. So, what I will do? You can pause your video. You can read the question if you have not read it already. You read the question because I will be directly discussing question and their answer. Correct? See, I don't want to consume your much time. So, what I will do? I will give you time to read the question. You pause the video, you read the question. I am directly going to discuss the questions. Correct? Now, I believe you have already read the question. Now, let us start. The first question they are asking over here is, in the lights of the given facts, the general meeting of the shareholder was decided to be scheduled. Now, they are asking you, determine by which date the notice to the shareholder should have been given to the members. So, by reading the question, I came to know that company is proposing to hold their annual general meeting on 25th August 2022. Now, if you know, there is a section called as section 101 of Companies Act 2013 which talks about notice of general meeting. Notice of general meeting and it has been specifically specified that notice should be given before 21 clear days. So, it means clear days. You know? 21 clear days before the date of general meeting. 21 clear days before the date of general meeting. So, if meeting is going to be held on 25th of August, if I am not wrong, correct? So, here clear days means the date when you are sending notice and the date on which meeting is to be held will not be counted. Say for example, if I am holding meeting on 25th August 2022, then 25th August will not be counted. So, if I want to count 21 clear days, 21 clear days. So, my answer will be C, that is 3rd August. C, 3rd August 2022. If I will give notice on 3rd August 2022, then this date will also be not counted. Clear days means the date on which you are giving notice and the date on which the meeting is to be held will not be counted. And if the notice is given by post, then additional 2 days will also not be counted after sending notice. A yes or no, 48 hours. If you are sending notice by post, then additional 48 hours will also not be counted. But since in question, it is nowhere mentioned, nowhere specified that the notice is given by post. So, what we will assume? That company has sent notice by electronic mode and we will not exclude two days. Since in question, it is nowhere given that they are sending notice by post. So, what we will assume? That notice is given by mail. 
So if I mark option C, you can clearly see I will get 4th August to 24th August and if you count it will be 21 clear days. Correct? Simple. So option is C. Now next question. Whether the adjournment of general meeting of shareholders of Sri Tires Limited for want of quorum was justified? Obviously, yes. Now, if you remember, there is a section called as 103 of Companies Act which talks about quorum. Correct? There, the number have been specified and apart from that, it has been clearly specified that company should wait for 30 minutes to start the meeting for the want of quorum. If there is no quorum present till 30 minutes, company will adjourn the meeting. Correct? Eh? So now, answer will be yes, it was justified since the quorum was not present within 30 minutes. Correct? Now, the next question is, what shall be the quorum of general meeting of shareholders? Now, see, here we have, now since Sri Tires Limited, Sri Tires Limited, correct? Na? The company involved in the question is a public company. So for public company, the quorum is, for public company, the quorum is, if company has member 1000 to 5000, then 15 member person is present. And if company is more than 5000, then 30 member person is present. Yes or no? But in this given situation, you should know this, that quorum should be as per section 103. This is 103, right? As per section 103 or AOA, whichever is higher. As per section 103 or AOA, whichever is higher. Which means, it has been specifically written over there that if articles of association of the company prescribes for higher quorum, prescribes for higher quorum, then we will follow articles of association. So, since in the given question, the articles of company provide that there should be 50 members present, so the quorum for the given question will be 50. If nothing would have written in the articles, it would have been 1515. But since article contains at least 50 members then it follow 50 simple and 1.4 as some members left the meeting the quorum was not present all the time during the AGM so the agendas for special transaction remained unapproved so what is your opinion they are asking for you for your opinion you people who are still figuring out how to cover syllabus they are asking your opinion ki please tell us that what will be your opinion in this particular situation? Now, as you know, the quorum should be present throughout the meeting. Throughout the meeting. If for any matter quorum is not present, that matter discussed will be nil. Invalid. Correct? So, see, the right answer will be B. The quorum should be present all the time when the meeting is in progress. And any time which could, be, could not be approved by the members for want of quorum shall be treated as nil. So, overall, a very easy question. Correct? Moving forward to second question. Now again, you are supposed to pause the video, read the question and then I will be discussing questions with you and answers with you. I hope you have read questions. You have read the entire case study basically. Now I, am, I will be discussing questions. See, in the lights of the given facts, in the lights of the given facts, that is case study, state which statement is correct as regard to the right of bank on retaining the goods lying in the go down on retaining the goods lying in the go down. So, they are asking you that what is your opinion in this particular situation. So, first option is when the outstanding amount taken for working capital has been paid, the bank cannot retain the goods or bank can retain the goods till all the charges including interest, insurance and other are paid by UP. Bank can retain only portion of the goods to cover its dues or bank may release the goods and then recovery uh, and then for recovery file suit. So, see very simple. Yukti has kept her goods for working capital. So, bank can retain her goods for all the charges including interest and other charges. Interest, insurance and other charges. So, the correct option will be B option. Correct? Bank can keep my goods with themselves until I have paid their loan, interest, insurance or any other charges. Simple? Easy? Now, now in the, if in the given case, Yukti pays all the expenses all the expenses including disputed insurance premium. Now, if you have read the question, you must know, you must have known that there is dispute with respect to insurance, insurance premium. Yukti is saying that she will not pay, bank is saying that we charge. So, what happened, you know, Yukti paid all the expenses, but bank insists to clear the personal loan. 
नाउ सी युक्ति हैज टेकन टू डिफरेंट लोन वन इज फॉर बिजनेस वन इज फॉर हर पर्सनल पर्पज एंड द कंसेप्ट दैट वी हैव इन दिस पर्टिकुलर क्वेश्चन रिलेट्स टू कॉन्ट्रैक्ट ऑफ प्लेच करेक्ट ना रिलेट्स टू कॉन्ट्रैक्ट ऑफ प्लेच सो दे आर आस्किंग यू वॉट इफ बैंक इंसिस्ट दैट इवन आफ्टर यू हैव पेड योर वर्किंग कैपिटल लोन फॉर विच यू हैव गिवन सिक्योरिटी बट यू हैव नॉट क्लियर योर पर्सनल लोन सो वी विल नॉट गिव योर गुड्स विच यू हैव केप्ट अ सिक्योरिटी करेक्ट सो डिटरमाइन वेदर बैंक इज एंटाइटेड डू सो द आंसर विल बी no the bank has no right to retain the goods pledged with it since the personal loan was not taken on the security of goods very simple na yukti took two loan one is for working capital one is for personal purpose now working capital loan was secured so since yukti has paid the working capital loan including all insurance charges etc etc so they will have to give the goods which was kept as security back to yukti and for personal loan she has not given any security she has not given any security so bank is not having right to keep goods for personal loan with themselves correct but what if in the given situation bank at the time of contract only clearly specified that yukti you have taken working capital also from us you have taken personal loan from us will keep your goods as security for working capital also and for personal loan also to which yukti agreed so in that case bank can keep but since in the given case there is no such communication there is no such agreement there is no such contract which means if yukti has paid the loan of working capital she is entitled to get her goods back simple now moving forward 2.3 yukti disputed the amount demanded by the bank towards the insurance premium paid by the bank okay now yukti emphasized that there was no need to take the insurance policy okay no need to take insurance policy on the goods pledge because it is an extra burden on the part of the borrower so what yukti is alleging you know yukti is saying that why to charge insurance premium for loan i don't want any insurance for loan why you are creating extra burden on a borrower so the answer to this question will be b because every bank has a policy to get the security insured on which it grants loan so in this case also the bank has done the right thing and the act of bank is justified so the most appropriate answer from all four is answer number option number b simple done and last question see what is the level of question that they are asking when yukta is availing the working capital finance she has kept something as security which is called as white goods so what is this obviously this is pledge of goods obviously this is pledge of goods don't get confused this is not bailment this is pledge because the specific purpose was to keep the goods as security for a debt so this is pledge and since it is pledge it will be bailment because we all know that pledge is a species of bailment so right option will be pledge don't mark it as bailment now third question is a clause that begins with word notwithstanding anything contained is called now this question relates to interpretation of statutes any word is begin uh, any line is starting with notwithstanding then it is called as non obstinate clause i repeat it is called as what non obstinate clause simple acha fourth one is where a share capital of the company is divided into different classes of shares so the right attached to shares of any class may be varied with the consent in writing of the holders of how many which means here they are asking that if a company wants to make variation in shareholders right shareholders right of a particular class then what is the requirement what is the requirement see this relate to section number 48 of company act 2013 and in section number 48 they have specifically given that we should obtain consent of 3/4 i repeat 3/4 of the issued shares of that class yes or no ठीक है नाउ व्हाट स्टूडेंट्स वेर आस्किंग मी यू नो व्हेन आरटीपी केम आउट फ्यू स्टूडेंट्स वेर यू नो वेरी प्रोएक्टिव दे ओपन देयर आरटीपी दे सॉ द क्वेश्चन एंड देन दे सेंड मी द डाउट सर थ्री फोर्थ एंड सेवेंटी फाइव परसेंट आर वन एंड द सेम सो व्हाई डोंट टू कंसिडर सेवेंटी फाइव परसेंट एंड वाई टू कंसिडर थ्री फोर्थ 
बिकॉज द लैंग्वेज इन कंपनीज एक्ट स्पेसिफिकली से थ्री फोर्थ सो राइट इफ यू वॉन्ट टू मार्क राइट आंसर एंड इफ यू वॉन्ट टू स्कोर मार्क्स यू विल हैव टू मार्क थ्री फोर्थ ओनली से फॉर एग्जाम्पल इन इंडियन कॉन्ट्रैक्ट एक्ट देर इज नथिंग कॉल्ड एस ऑफर द वर्ड दे हैव यूज इज कॉल्ड एस प्रपोजल Despite the meaning of proposal and offer is same, they have used the word proposal. So here also we will not mark seventy five percent. The word in section forty eight clearly says three fourth. So we'll mark three fourth. Fifth question very difficult. I was unable to solve it. Somehow, somehow I managed to solve it. See the level of question that they are asking. A public company may be formed by. Wait a second. They are asking how many members will be required to form public company. Let me think. Let me think. It is two, one, seven. Okay, so seven or more person. Simple. Is this a question to be asked in examination? It's very simple. So these were our five MCQ question. Correct. Coming to the descriptive part. Again, the first question. Geeta Private Limited is a startup company, and Mr. Prabodh has been appointed as account manager of Geeta Private Limited. Now you have to advise Mr. Prabodh about the statements that are required to be prepared. As per section two clause fourteen, financial statements. See, they have made your job very easy. They have given you section. They have given you the the heading for which that section stands. That is financial statements. They are just asking to you now that what are the uh, document or what are the requirement there under section two clause forty for financial statements? Very simple. A company has to prepare P and L. बैलेंस शीट कैश फ्लो स्टेटमेंट एंड एक्सप्लेनेटरी नोट है ना एंड स्टेटमेंट ऑफ चेंजेस इन इक्विटी स्टेटमेंट ऑफ चेंजेस इन इक्विटी आई होप इफ यू रिवाइज सेक्शन नंबर वन ट्वेंटी नाइन रेडवी सेक्शन टू क्लॉस फोर्टी यू नो दिस दैट फाइनेंशियल स्टेटमेंट कंटेन पी एन एल बैलेंस शीट कैश फ्लो स्टेटमेंट स्टेटमेंट ऑफ चेंजेस इन इक्विटी एंड नोट्स टू अकाउंट दैट इज एक्सप्लेनेटरी स्टेटमेंट अपार्ट फ्रॉम दैट इफ यू नो दर इज एन एक्सम्शन टू स्टार्ट अ प्राइवेट कंपनी startup private company like geeta private limited is not required to prepare cash flow statement is not required to prepare cash flow statement correct simple done correct so what you will write that under 2 clause 40 here are the things that are required and since geeta private limited is startup they are not required to prepare cfs easy now the second question a uh, very easy huh? first question Now, second question is, Mr. Aditya had incorporated a one-person company on seventh July two thousand twenty-one. Now, Mr. Yash was named as nominee, so Aditya has incorporated OPC, and nominee is Yash, if I am not wrong. Correct, no? Nominee is Yash, है ना? Of the said one-person company. Now, Mr. Aditya, considering the perpetual nature of the company, form of business, desire to appoint ABC Private Limited as nominee. so can he do so now if you remember only a natural person who is a citizen of india and whether or not resident of india can become member or nominee of one person company now since aditya wants to appoint abc private limited as nominee he cannot do so because abc private limited is not a natural person it is an artificial person correct so aditya cannot appoint abc private limited as nominee since abc private limited abc private limited is artificial person and nominee can be only natural person clear simple easy now third question A and his wife have a joint DMAT account in Vrinda Limited. Vrinda Limited is a company, and A and B have joint DMAT account. Now the company's AGM is supposed to be held on twenty eighth August. Now they are asking who will cast the vote in AGM. Who will cast the vote in AGM? Now if you don't know, let me tell you. In case of joint DMAT account holder, the person whose name is written first in the order will cast the vote. i repeat the person the person whose name 
is written first in the order in register of members in register of members will get to vote will get to vote say for example a's name is written first so a will vote b's name is written first so b will vote now while writing answer to these kind of questions your conclusion will be that the vote will be casted by a person whose name is written first which may be a or b correct eh? because they have not specified whose name is written first so they have given you a diplomatic question we will give them diplomatic answer that in the given situation the person whose name appears first can vote in the ag simple done now question number 4 Prabhas Limited is a company having shares listed on recognized stock exchange. Okay, fine. So, it is a listed company. Prabhas Limited is a listed company. Now, the company has 5,000 members also. Okay, fine. So, the AGM of the company is to be held on 7th September 2022. So, as per the provision of company that advise the company remote e-voting period and the time of closing remote e-voting. See, since it is a listed company as well as it has members more than 1,000, that is it has 5,000 members. So, the Prabhas Limited is compulsorily required to conduct its voting by e-voting. Correct? Eh? Now, if you know the period of e-voting, period of remote e-voting, period of remote e-voting. When I say remote e-voting means e-voting from a place other than the venue of AGM. E-voting from a place other than the venue of AGM. So, the period of remote e-voting will be minimum 3 days. Remote e-voting should be opened for minimum three days and it shall it shall be closed one day before date of meeting at 5 pm at 5 pm that means after 5 pm voting lines will be closed so now the meeting is scheduled on 7th september correct Meeting is scheduled on 7th September. So, one day before meeting, that is 6th September, 5 p.m. I repeat, 6th September, 5 p.m. Voting will be closed. Voting will be closed. Achha, but it should remain open for 3 days minimum. So, 4th September, 5th September and 6th September. So, 4th, 5th, 6th, on 6th, voting will be closed by 5 p.m. Am I clear? Am I clear? Easy. Eh na? So, we will have to write that voting will begin from 4th September. It will end on 6th September. I repeat, voting will begin on 4th September and it will end on 6th September at 5 p.m. Simple? Easy? Now, moving ahead. All four questions were easy. Now, fifth question. Very simple. Demand Limited is a company incorporated in India. You know, Demand Limited is a company which is incorporated in India. Now, Demand is a leading manufacturer of sports shoes. It has many subsidiaries. Many subsidiaries. One of them being Best Shoes Limited. So, Demand is Indian company. It has subsidiary in Morocco named as Best Shoes Limited. Now, Demand is in the process of finalization of CFS. As you all know, as per section 29, every company which has subsidiary or associate or joint venture should prepare consolidated financial statements. Hey na? So, demand is also preparing consolidated financial statements. Correct? The accounts section of demand limited has requested the management of best shoes to provide its standalone financial statements to demand limited. As a subsidiary prepares its financial statements in local language of the country and the same is provided to Indian parent company. Further, audit of financial statement is not required by the best shoe limited under the Moroccan laws. So, advise how would demand limited, how would demand limited deal with the consolidation, you know, deal with the consolidation of such financial statements. Very simple. It has been clearly specified in section 129 that if any subsidiary company is outside India and if it is preparing books of accounts or financial statements in their own language. So, whenever holding company will consolidate, it will be translated into English language. Yes, it will be translated into English language. Achha, regarding audit, so if Best Shoes is not required to audit their financial statement as per their law, 
सो होल्डिंग कंपनी विल अटैच अन ऑडिटेड फाइनेंशियल स्टेटमेंट ऑफ बेस्ट शूज लिमिटेड इट इज गिवन इन सेक्शन वन ट्वेंटी नाइन करेक्ट सो टू थिंग्स फर्स्ट दे विल ट्रांसलेट इट इन टू इंग्लिश सेकेंड दे विल अटैच अन ऑडिटेड ओनली डिमांड इज नॉट रिक्वायर्ड टू गेट इट ऑडिटेड बिकॉज एज पर देर लॉ दे आर नॉट रिक्वायर्ड टू गेट देर फाइनेंशियल स्टेटमेंट ऑडिटेड सिंपल इजी नाउ नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन ओवर इज वॉट आर दोविजन ऑफ कंपनी रिलेटिंग टू अपॉइंटमेंट ऑफ डिबेंचर ट्रस्टी देव आस्क यू क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम डिबेंचर ट्रस्टी एंड सेक्शन सेक्शन ऑफ डिबेंचर ट्रस्टी सेक्शन सेवेंटी वन रेड विथ रूल एटीन नाउ If you don't know rule, then that's okay. But you should know section at least. Correct? Section seventy one, rule eighteen. So they are asking, what is the legal provision of debenture trustee? So every company issuing secure debenture should appoint debenture trustee. And however, debenture trustee should be appointed by company to protect the interest of debenture holders. And they are asking whether the following can be appointed as debenture trustee. If you read the disqualifications of debenture trustee, you will come to know that a person who is holding shares in the company. Cannot be appointed as debenture trustee. The person who is director, KMP officer or employee cannot be appointed as debenture trustee. The person who is indebted cannot be appointed as debenture trustee. A, are you recollecting those lines that are written in disqualification? So keeping those disqualification in mind, first a shareholder of the company who has shares of rupees ten thousand, a member cannot be appointed as debenture trustee. so here in this case a shareholder cannot be appointed second a creditor to whom the company owes 999 only no he can also not be appointed as debenture trustee because any person who has pecuniary relation with company cannot be appointed as debenture trustee it has been given over there and a person who has been given a guarantee for repayment of amount of debenture issued by the company so this in this case also the person cannot be appointed as debenture trustee it is also one of the point of disqualification Correct, easy, simple. Now they have asked you what one direct question. Very simple. State the person responsible for complying with the provision regarding maintenance of books of accounts. Now who are responsible to maintain the books of account? This question relates to section number one twenty eight, read with section number two clause thirteen uh, of Companies Act two thousand thirteen. Now who are responsible to maintain books of account? Very simple. Whole time director in charge of finance, or CFO, or MD, or any other person in charge, है ना? Any other person who is in charge or responsible, correct? Very simple. Done. Now, eight point, eight question relates to question of auditor. Now, everyone knows that if a firm has completed its tenure. Or if an individual auditor has completed his tenure, then there is a cooling of period for five years, correct? And there should be no common partner, no incoming outgoing partner, if you remember, right? So in the given case, Mr. Govind Ram is a partner and in charge, and certifies financial statements of PN Associates. Now the firm is appointed as an auditor firm of Kana Limited. Now what Govind Ram does is Govind Ram retires. From P and Associates and joins Gupta and Gupta firm as a partner on twenty twentieth May. Now in general meeting of Kana, they are appointing Gupta and Gupta firm as their next auditor. Can they do so? No, because Govind used to certify financial statements of P and Associates when they were audit of Kana Limited. Now Govind has joined Gupta and Gupta, so in that case, Govind. If Govind has appointed, or Govind has admitted as partner in Gupta and Gupta, so Gupta and Gupta are also not eligible to be appointed as auditor for next five years of Kana Limited. Correct? Now this question relates to your audit as well. You have company audit in your audit subject, है ना? Very easy questions from that perspective. Very 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 easy question. Correct? So Gupta and Gupta cannot be appointed as auditor. Cannot be appointed as auditor. Okay, so these were the eight question which they have given from company law, and by going these all eight questions, the questions are not that difficult if you have studied or revised. The questions are neutral. It is not much difficult, not very easy. Now coming to other laws, they have given only four questions in other laws. 
first i will deal with the question which talks about interpretation of statutes direct question very simple how will you interpret the definition in a statute if the following words are used so basically they are asking you about means and includes now everyone knows means means it is exhaustive and includes is inclusive so you 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 have to explain means and includes it is very 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 direct question and if you remember any illustration any example so they are asking example as well so they are making sure that the student have you know not only ratify uh, rat, uh, ratta basically ye cut karna jo main bola students continue kar so they have to see whether students uh, they have to see whether student remember the illustrations or not as well so you have to write means includes and one illustration for see you can write illustration of company re company means a company incorporated under company act 2013 or previous company law and for includes you can write uh, debenture includes debenture stock and uh, bonds and other securities evidencing that you can write that also simple hai na now uh one question they have asked from general clauses act 1897 very simple section 2 18 aa of income tax act 1961 Provide that a company is said to be company in which public are substantially interested. If a company which is registered under twenty five of Companies Act nineteen fifty six. Now many of you don't know what is section number twenty five of Companies Act nineteen fifty six. Have you guys ever heard about company with charitable object? Yes or no? Have you guys ever heard about a company having charitable object? If the answer is yes, then it was. in section 25 of companies act 1956 which is in section number 8 of companies act 2013 hai na so after the advent of companies act 2013 that is companies act 2013 came the corresponding change has not been made in section 2 clause 18 of company uh, income tax act 1961 so explain with reference to provision of general clauses act how we will interpret income tax act 1961 see this question relates to section number 8 of general clauses act 1897 now very simple under income tax act there is section called as 2 clause 18 in that section company is defined pub, uh, a charitable object company is defined as a company under section 25 of companies act 1956 but see since 1956 has been repealed so wherever in any law it is written as companies act 1956 it will automatically be implied that they are referring to companies act 2013 only correct so simple whenever we will read income tax act 1961 and whenever we will come across section 2 18 aa there the meaning of a company in which public are substantially interested means section 8 company under the companies act 2000 30 correct eh? so we'll write this answer you'll have to write section 8 simple so two simple questions one from general clauses one from interpretation now the general the question from general clauses was not that simple but interpretation wala was very simple now they are asking one question from indian contract also let us see we shall build 50 kg of high quality sugar to nourish so basically here is vishal he build 50 kg of sugar to whom to nareesh correct acha who is vishal vishal becomes bailer nareesh becomes bailey who owned a kirana shop acha nareesh's kirana shop also kirana shop means grocery store promising to give rupees 200 at the time of taking the bail goods taking back the bail goods so which means basically vishal has kept the goods with nareesh for safe custody and once the purpose is over we shall will pay 200 to nareesh and will get his goods back now when nareesh was not at shop his employee unaware of bill sugar of vishal mixed the 50 kg of sugar belonging to vishal with the sugar in the in his shop and packaged it for sale that means one of the employee of nareesh mixed the goods of vishal mixed the goods of vishal without knowledge of vishal and now this came to light only when vishal came asking for the sugar he had bill with nareesh as the price of this specific quality of sugar had trebled so what is the remedy available to vishal as per provision of indian contract 
अच्छा दिस रिलेट टू ड्यूटी ऑफ बेली दिस क्वेश्चन रिलेट्स टू ड्यूटी ऑफ बेली अच्छा देर इज वन पॉइंट देर इज वन पॉइंट दैट इट इज द ड्यूटी ऑफ बेली इट इज द ड्यूटी ऑफ बेली नॉट टू मिक्स नॉट टू मिक्स गुड्स विथ इज ओन गुड्स विदाउट कंसेंट ऑफ बेलर विदाउट कंसेंट ऑफ बेलर अच्छा नाउ 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 इफ बेली मिक्सेस गुड्स विदाउट कंसेंट ऑफ बेलर देन देर कैन बी टू पॉसिबिलिटीज वन गुड्स कैन बी सेपरेटेड द मिक्स गुड्स कैन बी सेपरेटेड एंड द अदर पॉसिबिलिटीज गुड्स कैन नॉट बी सेपरेटेड अच्छा If the goods can be separated, if the goods can be separated, then bailer will have interest in his goods. Bailer will have interest in his goods. But, 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 but. See, I am writing over here. Both the parties, both the parties, will have interest in their respective shares. both the parties will have interest in their respective shares but if there is any cost incurred for separating the goods it will be recovered from bailee only acha if the goods cannot be separated then bailer will get damages from bailee bailer will get damages from bailee a yes or no yes or no correct na easy very simple so now in this case since the goods which is mixed is sugar which cannot be separated so we shall will get what we shall will get damages from bailee that is narish am i clear simple very easy question very easy question it relates to bailment it relates to what bailment now you can start the answer to this question is like that that if you don't know the individual section of bailment you can escape like you can write like that the provision of bailment are governed as per section 148 to 171 of Indian Contract Act 1872. You can write like this also, correct? And the last question of our RTP, Mr. Zahid. Mr. Zahid accepted a bill of exchange, okay, and gave it to Mr. Kamil for the purpose of getting it discounted, and handing over the proceeds to Mr. Zahid. Mr. Kamil couldn't get the bill discounted and return the bill to the side, which means they are explaining or they are you know narrating a Story, basic story that Zahid gave bill to Kamil for discounting. The bill was not discounted, so Kamil gave it back to Zahid. Hey na? Now, Mr. Zahid cut the bill in two pieces for the purpose to cancel it and threw the pieces on the street. Now, the, since since the bill was not discounted, Zahid would have been disappointed. So, what Zahid did? Zahid cut the bill in two pieces and threw it on the street. Maybe in frustration or something. Now what Kamil did? Kamil picked up the pieces and joined those pieces in such a manner that bill seemed genuine, and bill seemed to have been folded for safe custody rather than cancelled. Now Kamil is a person with guilty mind over here. Kamil is fraud. <laughs> what he did? He picked up the pieces from the street and joined it back. So now, Mr. Kamil put it into circulation, and it finally reached to Mr. Sali. Mr. Salim, who took it on good faith and for value, now explain as per Negotiable Instruments Act whether Mr. Zahid is liable to pay the bill to Mr. Salim. Now, please, in this question, think from Mr. Salim's point of view. Now, every one of you know holder in due course. Every one of you know holder in due course, which is HIDC, which is HIDC. Now, who is holder in due course? Holder in due course is basically a person who have obtained instrument for consideration in good faith and before maturity. So here also in the given situation, Mr. Salim has got instrument for in good faith, for value, and obviously before maturity. Correct. So Mr. Salim is holder in due course as per section nine. Holder in due course as per section nine. So will holder in due course. Get payment 
yes because we have learned that holder in due course gets a better title and his title is not dependent on the title of transfer correct easy so salim will get payment from zaid zaid is liable to pay to salim and zaid can later claim damages from kamil who has done all this gamble correct easy done so my answer will be yes salim will get payment from zaid and zaid is liable to pay salim easy so this was your rtp for november 22 attempt here we have completed our entire rtp along with amendments which are not a material but we'll have to still refer to it and all the questions that were given and simultaneously i have wrote answers over there as well clear now what i expect from you guys is please study hard study with passion study consistently and all the very best for your examination i hope this rtp and the previously uploaded revision lecture will help you a lot thank you so much guys goodbye take care